Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about the dot product and the cross product. Now we have some idea of vectors under our belt, so we can move on to looking at two new ways that vectors can interact, the dot product and the cross product. These ideas are very important and useful in advanced math, science, especially in physics and engineering. So if you have any interest in those fields, you definitely want to pay extra attention here, but you're also going to need it just for this course. All right, with each of these, we'll start off by looking at an algebraic definition and then exploring what that means in a geometric interpretation so we can get a sense of how this would look as opposed to just a bunch of numbers. All right, let's go. First off, the dot product. Given two n-dimensional vectors, that is vectors that have n components, where n will just be some number, u, which will be our first component, u1, our second component, u2, up until the nth component, un, right? So u1, u2, u3, all the way up until we get to un. And v, which is the same thing, v1, v2, up until vn. So first component of v, second component of v, up until the nth component, the last component, since it's just n-dimensional. Then the dot product, which is symbolized by just, you know, exactly as you'd guess, a dot between the vectors, is the sum of the products of each pair of components. So u dot v, which would be the same thing as u1, u2, up until un, dotted with v1, v2, up until vn, would produce u1, v1. So the u1, the first component here, and the first component here, they multiply together, and then we add that to the second component here, and the second component here, and then we add that to the all of the ones in between, and then we add that to un, the last one, multiplied by the, ad, the last one of v as well. So we've got the first two components multiplied together, the second two components multiplied together. We do this for every one of them until we get to the last two components multiplied together. So we add each of the possible component pairs, each of the component pairs between u and v for everybody who is in the same component location. We multiply each of those together and then we sum it all up. Notice that the dot product will result in a scalar, not a vector. So what we get out of this in the end isn't another vector, it's just a real number. And if we're talking about this, we say u dot v. So the symbols vector u dot product with vector v, we just say as u dot v, as you've heard repeatedly me say. Okay, so let's see an example in two dimensions. So if we've got 5, 2 dotted with negative 7, 12, then what we do is we multiply the first two components, 5 and negative 7, so we've got 5 times negative 7, and then we add that with 2 and 12 multiplied together. So 5 and negative 7 gets us negative 35 plus 24, and finally we get negative 11 as our answer when we add it together. All right, so it turns out that the dot product of two vectors is deeply related to the angle between the vectors and their magnitude. Now, for us to talk about the angle between the vectors, we can't have them in totally separate places. We have to put them together. So let's say we've got two vectors like this and this. Before we can talk about the angle and the dot product, we have to put them tail to tail. Now, once they're tail to tail, we can talk about the angle between them. So right from here to here, where my face is, would be the angle, right? So you with theta in between, and then v is the two angles. Now it turns out that u dot v is equal to the length of u. Remember, just if we have vertical bars on either side, that says the length of it, which we get by that magnitude formula, square root of each component squared and added together. So u dot v is equal to the length of u times the length of v times cosine theta. If we want, we can shift this around to have the formula that makes the angle a little more accessible. So right now we've got cosine theta, but there's other stuff multiplied by it. So we could solve for cosine theta. We'd have cosine theta equals u dot v divided by the length of u times the length of v. And then at that point, if we want to find out the angle, we could just take the arc cosine of both sides, the cosine inverse of both sides, and we'd figure out what our angle is. For the most part, though, I prefer this formula because I think it's a little bit easier to remember that u dot v is equal to length u, length v times cosine of the angle between them. All right. It turns out that we can actually prove this formula pretty easily. It's not going to be that hard for us to prove it, but it won't really help us directly understand vectors any better. As such, the proof is still going to be in this lesson, but it's been put at the end after the extra, after the examples. So if you wait until we get through all the examples, you'll get to see the proof if you're curious about it. So if you have a few extra minutes and you're interested, awesome. I'd love to have you check it out. It's really cool to just get the sense of more things in math, all the proofs. But if you're busy and you don't have time for it, that's okay too. It's really, if you had to miss one proof, this is probably the best one to just skip and take in faith. So don't worry about it if you wind up not being able to watch this proof, but if you've got the time and you're interested in proofs, it's really cool and it's totally something we can actually manage pretty easily. 
Okay, so let's interpret this geometrically. We can break up our new formula u dot v equals length u times length v times cosine theta into length u times length v times cosine theta. So we think of it as two different pieces, the length of one vector times the length of the other vector multiplied by cosine theta. So what that gives us, if we look at this, this v length v times cosine theta is a way of thinking of the length of v if we projected it onto u. So v is a projection onto the vector u. So what does that mean? Let's look at these pictures here. So we've got v here, right? V is this vector here. So if V is shorter than U, we project it by dropping a perpendicular down to U. And then what we've got is wherever U went up until that perpendicular that we just dropped down, that's our length v length v times cosine theta. So that gives us the length of the projection. So we can think about this idea as how far we drop down. Once we drop down this perpendicular onto u, we've created a projection of v onto u. It's like you take a flashlight and you shine it directly down onto it. It's the shadow that v would cast on u. So length of v times cosine theta, well remember this is after all since it's a perpendicular we drop down, we've got a right angle in there. So since we've got a right angle in there, we've got theta, it's just basic trigonometry, cosine of theta times the length of the hypotenuse, length v, will give us the length that it is for that projection, the shadow that we just created. And we can also do this if our vector v winds up being longer than u. Instead of worrying about how long are we on u, it's if u had continued, right? This dotted line right here. If u had continued and then we dropped a perpendicular onto if it had continued, where would we wind up being onto that continuation? So we think of u and then we think of u continuing off forever and then v drops down onto that and that gives us our projection of v. So this gives us another way to think about where this is coming from. So it's the length of the projection multiplied by the length of the vector it's being projected onto. So we see u dot v is the length of one vector, so the length of one vector, u in this case, multiplied by the length of the other vector's projection. So our other vector would be v, and its projection was this part right here. So that is length v cosine theta. In general, we can interpret the dot product as a measure of how long and how parallel two vectors are. So, for example, if we have two vectors like this, we're going to get a larger dot product the smaller our theta, theta is because cosine of numbers close to zero gets us numbers that will be close to one, right? Cosine of zero is one, that's the absolute maximum. When they're perfectly parallel, that's going to be the largest possible projection that v can make onto u. As it gets less and less parallel, more and more perpendicular though, cosine theta is going to become smaller and smaller. This projection that's dropping down is going to become smaller and smaller until finally we eventually hit perpendicular and it drops down and there's no projection whatsoever, right? It's like shining a shadow on something pointing straight up. It doesn't cast a shadow at all. There's no projection that comes out of it. So once they're perfectly perpendicular, we're going to get nothing out of it. But if they're parallel, the more parallel they are, the longer they are, the larger the thing will get out of the dot product, the larger the value that will get out of the dot product. This brings up a good point, this idea that when they are perpendicular, right, when we have cosine of 90 degrees or cosine of pi over 2 degrees versus radians, we wind up getting cosine will spit out as a zero. It goes to zero. So we'll have nothing coming from the dot product because there will be no uh, projected shadow onto it. So from our formula u dot v equals length u length v cosine theta, we see that if u dot v equals zero, then it must be the case that cosine theta equals zero, and if cosine theta equals zero, then theta equals 90 degrees. So if we have the dot product of two vectors as zero, we know we have perpendicularity. They have to be perpendicular to each other. So if u dot v equals zero, then u is perpendicular to v. And if u is perpendicular to v, then u dot v equals zero. I also want to point out that there's many equivalent words for perpendicular. Perpendicular is sometimes you'll hear normal, maybe even orthogonal, although you normally don't hear that until later math classes, or at right angles. But all of these might wind up meaning the same thing. Theta equals 90 degrees, or alternatively, theta equals pi over 2 if we're in radians. So perpendicular, normal, orthogonal, right angles, theta equals 90 degrees, theta equals pi over 2, they all mean the same thing, this idea of 
perpendicular, right? Something that we're used to from geometry. Don't get confused if you wind up hearing one of these synonyms. They just all mean the same thing. You're probably wondering why there are so many synonyms, and it's because it's a really important idea, and it shows up in a bunch of different places. So at different times, different people use different words, and so we wound up having like four different ways of talking about this. So that's why we see so many. Also, I want to point out one other thing. So technically up here, if we've got u dot v equals zero, well, if u or v could be the zero vector as well, right? If u or v was the zero vector, right, all zeros and all the components, then u dot v is going to come out as zero also, right? We'd get u dot v equals zero from that as well. But is our theta really going to be 90 degrees? Well, at that point, if we're just, you know, a dot, we're going to say that a dot, that zero vector, is just going to be perpendicular to everything because, you know, at that point it's not really sticking out in any direction, so that, it seems reasonable to say that it's perpendicular and it works well with our new idea of perpendicular, meaning that the dot product equals zero. So we get around this by saying that the zero vector is going to be perpendicular to all vectors. So if something is zero vector, it automatically is going to be perpendicular. But for the most part, when we think of this it's going to work perfectly well. And because of this new thing about saying that the zero vector is always going to be perpendicular, it works out all the time. So that is just always true. We can think of perpendicular as meaning dot product comes out to be zero. All right, let's talk about the cross product now. Unlike the dot product, the cross product will only work in three dimensions. So when you're in space, like three-dimensional space, that's when you can use the cross product. It takes two vectors and it produces a third vector that is perpendicular to both. So what it comes out of the cross product is something that will be perpendicular to our first vector and our second vector. So if u is equal to u1, u2, u3, and v is equal to v1, v2, v3, it is this monster, u cross v equals u2 v3 minus u3 v2, u3 v1 minus u1 v3, u1 v2 minus u2 v1, where each one of those is multiplied and then subtracted from the other. So those are our three components. We say u cross v uh, as u cross v, right? This vector u cross product with vector v, we just say as u cross v to make it easy. We'll calculate a product in example one, and basically this formula is tough to remember because it's just so many symbols at once. So there is a pretty good mnemonic for this, but you might not have seen what we're about to use for it. So we haven't learned about matrices or their determinants yet, but there's a great mnemonic if you are familiar with this. So if you learned about this in a previous math course, or if you go on and you watch the uh, lesson on determinants in a little bit and matrices, um, there's a great mnemonic for remembering the cross product by using the determinant of a three by three matrix and the standard unit vectors. So if we've got u cross v, we can also write that as the determinant of the three by three vector, sorry, three by three matrix, i, j, k on the top, then, the first vector u1, u2, u3 on the second one, and then v1, v2, v3. At this point, we take i, j, k, we do a cofactor expansion on i, j, k, so when we look at i, that will knock out the u1, v1, and the j, k, so we have i along with the determinant u2, u3, v2, v3 times i, the unit vector i, minus, next we do j, j will knock out u2, v2, so i knocked out u1, v1, and j and k. j will knock out i and k, and we'll also knock out u2, v2, leaving us with u1, u3, v1, v3, so we take the determinant of that, multiply that by our j, and then finally we get to k, k in its cofactor will knock out i, j, u3, v3, and so we get u1, u2, v1, v2, k, and then if you take the determinants of each of those two by two matrix, multiply on the diagonal going down, that is the positive, and then subtract on the diagonal going up. So u2, v3, minus u3, v2, i, minus u1, v3, minus u3, v1, j, plus u1, v2, minus u2, v1. So that's another way of doing it. Uh, it's a pretty good mnemonic. If you're familiar with determinants, it works great. If you're not familiar to this, that all probably didn't make very much sense. So you can go ahead and you can watch the later lesson on determinants, or you can just go back to that previous slide and just wind up memorizing that formula. There's not really a very easy way to memorize it other than this mnemonic, which works great, but if you don't know the mnemonic, it's a little different. Difficult. So, yeah, uh, it's really great if you learn determinants, though, and you will learn that later on, so it might be worth just learning it now so you can have this stuck in your head if you wind up having to do a lot of work with cross products. All right. So what does this mean geometrically? If you're given two vectors, u and v, the cross product produces a third vector, u cross v, that is perpendicular to both. So say we've got some u, right? We've got u going off like this, and then we've got v going off like this. 
Now what we've got, u cross v, is this third vector that comes out of both that will be perpendicular to both. So I think you can see this. So u cross v would wind up being perpendicular to both, right? It's perpendicular to u, but it's also perpendicular to v. And so it comes out like that. We've got u cross v. However, there's no, how do we tell which way u cross v is going to point? Right? The perpendicular vector can come out like this, but the perpendicular vector could also come out like this, right? There's nothing wrong with being perpendicular on the underside as well. So how do we tell which way you wind up going? So the trick to this is the right hand rule. You point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector, and then your palm goes in the direction of the second vector. You can also think of it as curling your fingers toward it. Then the cross product's direction is the direction your thumb points. So in this one, if this is U and this is V, then you put U, my fingers along U, and then my palm goes towards V. So U, V, and u cross v comes out like this, which is exactly what you get from this picture right here. If you do u with your hands and then v with your palm, sorry, u with your fingers, v with your palm, and then bring your thumb out, you'll be able to see u cross v coming out in purple there. I really recommend trying this out right in front of you right now, because there's really no way to get this sort of done geometrically in your head without actually seeing it visually in front of you. And then if we wanted to see what v cross u would be, v cross u, right hand rule, so this is our v, this is our u, so v goes first, V, fingers go in the V direction, and then U, palm goes in the U direction, so now our thumb is pointing down, so V, U, down, V cross U will go down like that, so that's the right hand rule. Fingers go in the first vector's direction, palm or fingers curling, either way you want to think about it, goes in the direction of the second vector, and whatever you've got with your thumb, that's the direction that your cross product is going to come out of it. Definitely worth trying that. Try it right now with this. Make sure you wind up seeing that you're getting the same stuff, that you can do this with your own hands, that you can see this, because it's really difficult to visualize purely with your mind, but if you use it with your hands, you'll be able to see it very well. This stuff comes up all the time in physics and engineering. Really important stuff there. All right, cross product. Now, another way to interpret this geometrically. So we talked about the direction, but we haven't talked about how long u cross v is going to be. The magnitude, how long u cross v will be, is equal to the area of the parallelogram that is enclosed by u and v, right? So we've got u and v. If we continue those out, right? So u is down here, and so we also do a parallel one here, right? This is parallel to this, and then our v here is parallel to this, so that makes a parallelogram. The area inside of that parallelogram is how long u cross v will be. So notice that the more parallel u is to v, the more squished it becomes, right? If this is our u and v. The more parallel they are, the less area that there's going to be inside of them. They get squished more and more. As we open it up more and more, though, we've got this larger area inside of it. So as we squish it down, as u becomes more parallel to v, the less area it has. The more perpendicular, the more we open it up, we've got this wide area, right? When we're perpendicular, we're going to have the maximum amount of area because we'll be a perfect square. So the more it opens up, the more perpendicular it are, the more it opens up, the larger the area becomes. With this in mind, we can interpret the length of u cross v as a measure of how long and how perpendicular the two vectors are, right? If the, if the vectors aren't very perpendicular at all, then we're not going to get much out of the cross product in terms of its length. If they're really perpendicular, we're going to get a lot more out of it. And of course, we can just make the vectors longer in the first place to increase this area. All right, we're ready for some examples. First one, a vector A equals 2, 4, negative 5. Vector B equals negative 3, 1, 2. First thing to do is give the cross product of A and B, A cross B. Then we want to show by the dot product that A is perpendicular to A cross B and that B is also perpendicular to A cross B. So our first thing to do is just figure out what is A cross B. So we've got 2, 4, negative 5, negative 3, 1, 2. So 2, 4, negative 5 crossed with negative 3, 1, 2. So we've got this formula here, right? Here's our formula. So for the first coordinate of our outcoming vector, outcoming cross product, it's going to be the second component of the first vector, u2, so u2 would be in this case 4, times the third component of the second vector, v3, so that would be 2 here, so 4 times 2 minus the third component of the first vector, so that's a negative 5, times the second component of the second vector, so v2, that's 1. 
same thing going on, see if you can follow along here. So u3 is negative 5 times v1, negative 3, minus u1, u1 in this case is 2, uh, v3 is 2 as well, comma, u1, v2, so u1 is 2, v2 is 1, minus u2 is 4, v1 is negative 3. Great. We start simplifying this out. We've got 8 minus a negative that cancels out. So we've got 8 plus 5. Negative 5 times negative 3 becomes positive 15. Minus 2 times 2, minus 4. 2 times 1, 2. Minus 4 times negative 3. They cancel out. We've got addition there as well. Plus 12. Simplify that, and we get 13, 11, 14. So that is A cross B. So there is equals A cross B. There is our cross product vector. Now we want to verify this. We want to show that it is indeed going to be perpendicular to both A and B because we know that the cross product has to be perpendicular to both of them, so that darn well better come out. So if A is perpendicular to A cross B, then that will be true if A dot A cross B comes out to be zero. So if a dot a cross b comes out to be zero, we know that's perpendicular by how the dot product works. Remember, that was our one of our big realizations about the dot product was that if theta is equal to 90 degrees, if the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, then the dot product of the two vectors always comes out to be zero. a dot a cross b, our a is 2, 4, negative 5, our b, that we're sorry, not our b, we're dotting that with a cross b, a cross b is 13, 11, 14, 2 times 13 is 26, plus 4 times 11 is 44, plus negative 5 times 14 is negative 70. 26 plus 44 becomes 70, so we've got 70 minus 70. That comes out to be 0, so that checks out. Our dot product came out to be 0, so we know they must be perpendicular. Great. Next one, b cross a cross b, sorry, show that b is perpendicular with a cross b, so b dotted with a cross b. b is negative 3, 1, 2. Our a cross b that we're dotting with, 13, 11, 14. Ran a little bit out of room there. So negative 3 times 13 becomes negative 39, plus 1 times 11 is 11, 2 times plus 2 times 14 is 28, negative 39 plus 39, 11 plus 28, negative 39 plus 39 becomes 0, so that checks out as well. The dot product of b with a cross b comes out to be 0, so we know that those two vectors must be perpendicular, so there we are, finish that one. All right, second example, we've got u equals 5, 2, 8, k, v equals 3, negative 4, 1, 3. What is k if u is perpendicular to v? So if u is perpendicular to v, then that tells us that u dot v equals 0. Great. So if u dot v equals 0, then we have that 5, 2, 8, k dotted with 3, negative 4, 1, 3 must come out. Whoops, sorry. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Equals 0. So we work this out, 5 times 3, 15, plus 2 times negative 4, negative 8, plus 8 times 1, 8, plus k times 3, 3k equals 0. Negative 8 plus 8, they cancel each other out, so we've got 15 plus 3k equals 0, 3k equals negative 15, which gives us k must equal negative 5. So nothing really difficult there as soon as we realize that if they are perpendicular, then it must be their dot product is zero. So at that point, we can set something up that we can just solve through simple algebra. Third example, in physics, the work done by a force F over a distance D is defined as force dotted with distance. So the work W is equal to the force vector dotted with the distance vector. If you push a box with a mass of 20 kilograms with a force of 100 newtons at an angle of 15 degrees above the horizontal for 10 meters, how much work have you done on the box? So the first thing we can do is we could figure out, all right, what is our force vector in terms of its components? So we could get force vector, right? So we get 
force equals component stuff, and then we'll figure out D equals component stuff. Well, that'll be easy because it's entirely horizontal. So we'll have to use trig to figure out what the force vector is in its component form, and then we can dot the two together. But that's actually more work than we have to do. All we have to do is remember, we don't need component form at all because we know if work equals the force vector dotted with the distance vector. Then force dotted with distance vector, well, u dotted with v is the same thing as length u times length v times cosine theta. So this is the length of our force vector times the length of our distance vector times the cosine of the angle between them. We know what our force vector is. It came out to be 100 newtons. The force was 100 newtons. We know what our distance is. We go for a distance of 10 meters, and we know what our angle theta is. Do we need the 20 kilograms of mass? Mass, 20 kilograms of mass actually never shows up for figuring out the work. The mass of the object has no effect on the amount of work that goes in. It's all about the force, the distance that goes, that happens, and the angle between those two, how the two uh, interrelate. So we actually don't need to know the mass of the box at all to figure this one out. It's just a red herring. So force is 100 newtons times distance is 10 meters times cosine is angle of 15 degrees. We work that out with the calculator, so we've got 1,000 times the cosine of 15 degrees, and that comes out to be 965.93. Now, what is the units of work? They told us in the problem the unit is the joule, or joules, which is signified with a J, so we use the unit of J at the end there. And there we are. There's our work. Great. All right, final example, prove that u dot u equals the magnitude of u squared. All right, so first thing to do, we have to have a way of talking about just some general vector u, because they didn't tell us much about u at all, right? They told us just vector u. So we need to be able to talk about what is vector u in a way that we can actually work with it. So let's just give the components names, right? So we'll do it the same way that has happened in all of the previous stuff, where we've just said first component is u1, so we'll make this u1. And then the second component will be u2. And then the third component would be u3. And all the way up until some un, right? Because every vector has to have some specific length. It's not allowed to go on forever. So we'll stop at un, which is n will be just the length of our vector. So this is going to be the case for any vector at all. We could put it in this form of first component, second component, up until its last component, which we'll say will be its nth location in the thing. All right, so now we have a way of doing this. Let's just look at what is u dot u, and then what is the magnitude of u squared? If they wind up being equal, we've proved this thing, right? So u dot u u dot u would be vector u1, u2, up until un, dotted with u1, u2, up until un. All right, so u1 times u1, well, u one's just some number, so that's u1 squared, plus u2 times u2, well, u2 is just some number, so that's u2 squared, Plus, this is just going to keep happening until we get to our final component. un times un, well, un is just some number as well, so un squared. So we've got u1 squared plus u2 squared up until we get to un squared. Now, there's not much we can do to simplify that there, right? So let's take a look at the magnitude of u squared. So first, what's the magnitude of u? Well, magnitude of any vector, remember, is each component squared, the square root of each component squared added together underneath the square root. So it would be the first component squared plus the second component squared up until the final component squared and all of that underneath the square root. Well, if we square this, then we got u squared, magnitude of u squared equals, well, if we square both sides of that equation above, square root times square root cancels out and we've just got u1 squared plus u2 squared up until un squared. Well, look, this and this are the same thing. So since they're the same thing, we've just shown that u dot u is equal to the magnitude of u squared. Great. Proof is finished. All right. So that finishes up for the examples. Uh, thanks for coming to educator.com, and we'll see you in the next lesson when we start talking about matrices. All right. Bye. All right, I think they're gone, everybody who's not actually interested in the proof. So, are you ready for this? B -b 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 bonus round! Okay, here we are, ready for the proof. Dot product formula. So let's prove that u dot v 
is equal to the length of u times the length of v times cosine theta. So the very first thing that you want to do anytime you're really trying to think about anything analytically is draw a picture. A picture is always a useful way to think about things. So we start off by drawing a picture, right? We've got, you know, u and v with theta in between. Now we look at this and we want to see, is there any way to connect the length of u, the length of v, and theta together? Is there some way to get these things to talk to each other, right? Do we know any way to say, yes, I know these are related? Well, we look at this for a while and we go, well, I don't see anything yet, but that looks, well, it looks kind of like a triangle. And I know a lot of stuff about triangles from trigonometry. So let's say it looks like a triangle without a top. Let's give that triangle a top. So we draw on the top, right? We draw on the top in this purple color and we might realize, hey, there's you, there's three sides to a triangle. I know an angle sort of. Oh, I can connect the length of u, the length of v, that angle theta, and the top, the length of the top together with something we learned in trigonometry, the law of cosines. We might remember this, and if we remember this, we just go back and we look up the law of cosines, right? There's no reason not to just go look it up. So we look up the law of cosines in a book, we refresh ourselves, and we get that the length a squared, so the side a squared, is equal to the other two sides squared, b squared plus c squared, minus 2 times b times c times cosine of capital A, where little a and capital A are the side and then the angle opposite. So little a is the side, the length of one side, and then capital A is the angle opposite that side. So we've got a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc times cosine of capital A. So that's the law of cosines. Now, we bring up our vectors picture and we look at this. Now, one thing before we keep going, how are we going to have this top as u minus v? So we can see the top as the vector u minus v since it runs from the head of v to the head of u. And think about this. If we take v and we add that to u minus v, well, the minus v and the positive v, they'd cancel out and we'd be left with just u. So it must be the case, we can see graphically through this algebra, that u and v, we can get from v to u by using u minus v, because it will take away the v and give us the u and we'll manage to get from the head of v to the head of u. Cool. So that's how we have that vector u minus vector v is a way to be able to talk about the top as a vector. All right, using the law of cosines, then we have that the length of u minus v, right, our a, length of u minus v squared is equal to the length of u, our b, right, this part right here, squared plus, so length of u squared, u minus v, plus the length of v, so this part right here, so we've got c squared minus 2 times the length of u times the length of c times cosine of the angle between them, so cosine of theta. So we've got the length of vector u minus v squared equals the length of u squared plus the length of v squared minus 2 times the length of u times the length of v times cosine theta. All right, looks like we're getting somewhere, right? We've got some relationships going on. Hey, we've even got that cosine theta if we're trying to prove that thing. So looks like we're getting there, but we still have this problem where we don't have any dot products there, right? So how can we get u dot v to show up in there? We want u dot v in there. Well, remember in example four, we just proved for any vector a, a dotted with itself, so a vector dotted with itself is equal to the magnitude of that vector squared. So A dot A equals the magnitude of A squared. Thus, we can swap out each of these magnitudes squareds for A dot A, right? So we've got that relationship. So whatever they are. So U minus V, the length of U minus V squared will become the Ma the vector u minus v dotted with the vector u minus v. u squared, the magnitude of u squared, will become the vector u dotted with the vector u. The magnitude of v squared will become v dot v. So we've got all of these swapping out right here. Okay. At this point, we didn't show this technically, but you can prove it to yourself, not that difficult. The dot product is distributive. So we can actually distribute using this dot product. So u minus v dot u minus v. Well, then we've got u dot u minus u dot v minus v dot u plus v dot v, right? u dot u, u dot u minus u dot v minus v dot u minus times negative again, so plus v dot v. Great. 
The stuff on the right just stays the same. At this point, we see we've got certain things on the right and the left. So if we've got v dot v on both sides, let's just subtract it on both sides. We've got u dot u on both sides. Let's just subtract it on both sides. So we've got minus u dot v minus v dot u. Well, notice u dot v is just the same thing as v dot u. So we can combine them together. If we've got u dot v plus v dot u, then that's the same thing as 2 times u dot v. So if we've got minus u dot v minus v dot u, then that's the same thing as negative 2 u dot v. So we've got negative 2 u dot v there on the left equals negative 2 length of u times the length of v times cosine theta. Hey, we've got negative 2 on both sides. Divide by negative 2 on both sides. Those cancel out. We've got u dot v equals the length of u times the length of v times cosine theta. Cool. And our proof is finished. Not too tough. All right, so thanks for sticking around. I think proofs are really cool. They're really, in my mind, the heart of mathematics, being able to show that this stuff is definitely always true. I think it's awesome. Thanks for sticking around. Glad to share it with you. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.